everyone. Uh, my name is Kyuk, uh, and this is my co-presenter, Pooja. And we're both from the Amazon Search Science and AI team. And uh, we're here to talk to you about research to production at Amazon scale, um, specifically about how we use PyTorch uh, on the cloud and what were some of the challenges and lessons learned in doing so. All right, so a bit of a team intro. Um, we're called Search Science and AI, and we are mostly an applied ML team within the larger search organization at Amazon. And what we do is, well, one of our goals is to build state-of-the-art universal semantic representation of Amazon entities. And I know this is a mouthful, so I'm going to spend the next two slides dissecting what this means so that we can all understand what we mean by this statement. All right, so here are some of the examples of what we mean by Amazon entities. Um, these are essentially things that make Amazon Amazon. And what we'd like to do is we would like to um, really capture the semantics of these uh, entities uh, and represent them in some form factor, uh, like a model or a mathematical vector. So remember how we said that we wanted these semantic representations to be universal, right? We, we just don't want any semantics. We actually want them to be universal. Um, and we can define universality across five different dimensions or categories. And this is why the project itself is called M5 across five different dimensions. Um, the first one is entity. So we just saw that uh, a lot of the entities at Amazon are, you know, there's not just one, but we have many. And we want to capture representations for all of them. Uh, the second one is modality. So customers interact or experience Amazon uh, through various modalities like text, if you're reading a review or a product description, uh, or audiovisual, if you're looking at images of a product or uh, a video of a review. Um, and also speech, if you're conversing with uh, Alexa. So we want to be able to capture the signals from all of these modalities so that we can actually have very accurate semantic representations. And then the next two, lingual and locale, have to do with the fact that Amazon is a global marketplace. So a lot of the times, these entities are actually going to span across multiple languages and multiple locales or marketplaces. So we want to be able to capture this uh, multilingualness and multilocalness of these semantic representations. And then finally, we want these uh, representations to be uh, multitask so that they can suffice the various types of use cases that we have in the core retail business. All right, uh, before I get started on the technical details of M5 and how we use PyTorch on the cloud, I wanted to spend a few minutes really giving a shout out to some of the PyTorch ecosystem libraries that we use today that have really made it easy for us to do research to production on the cloud. Um, and the three that I'm, I'd like to call out today are Torch Data, Torch Snapshot, and Torch X. And the reason for that is because all of these three libraries support AWS services out of the box. So if you have an AWS account and you would like to use PyTorch on it, if you use Torch Data, Torch Snapshot, and Torch X, it will work out of the box on AWS services. So as you can imagine, we're Amazon and we're very heavily on AWS. Uh, the second reason is that these, these three libraries kind of just work out of the box without you having to sit down and configure uh, or customize them very heavily to really fit your use cases. So they have a very short uh, time to first successful run. And that's really helped us be very productive with our experiments and really be able to focus on the core modeling aspect of things without having to worry about writing wrappers or shims to make these libraries work for us. Um, and we were also pleasantly surprised that the performance with the default configurations uh, were actually pretty decent. So, so far, we, we didn't really have to tweak a lot of those uh, uh, configurations to get the performance that we wanted. All right, um, as for the PyTorch core modules that we frankly don't use today in production, but that we're really excited about and we've actually started experimenting with, so we hope to actually start using them in prod pretty soon, are uh, Torch Dynamo, uh, Torch Distributed FSDP, and Funk Torch. And uh, I won't go into the details of what these libraries do. Um, you can refer to previous talks or blog posts and, uh, and documentations. But I'll just say that these three libraries as a whole, they will increase the, you know, the performance, the efficiency, the expressibility, uh, and the scalability of our PyTorch programs. So we're pretty excited about um, really using them to increase our productivity and speed of iteration. 
All right, so back to M5 and how the journey of an M5 model looks like from research all the way to production. We split this out into three different phases. Uh, the first is experiment, the second one is productization, and the third one is vending. So this split shouldn't really be a surprise to anybody. There, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that one would split the research to production in these three phases. Uh, but we'll take a look at these phases more in detail to give you a glimpse of how it looks like to uh, use PyTorch on AWS. All right, so the first stage is uh, the experimentation phase. This is the phase where most ML engineers are going to be authoring their training scripts. They're going to be trying out different model architectures as well as data sets and different training parameters. Um, and the speed of iteration and reproducibility is of the utmost importance in this phase. So we track all of the experiments that we have and their run metadata. And we also make sure that we archive the uh, code workspace that goes into these experiments. And this is very important for us because it helps us refer back to previous experiments to make the next set of experiments very high quality and also for productization. So for productization, because we're tracking all of this metadata and also the workspace or the code, um, we're able to actually have all of the references and information that's needed to move a successful experiment into production with a very high quality. Um, a lot of the runs at this phase are going to be very training heavy. So most of them are going to be your trainers. Uh, and your trainers need data. And we've actually experimented with a couple of data storage solutions on, S on, on AWS. And we ended up settling with S3. And the reason for this was because S3 scaled the best when it came to the variety of data sets that we have, the cardinality of data sets that we had, and the uh, sizes of data sets that we had, which ranged from anywhere between terabytes all the way to uh, you know, double-digit uh, petabytes. Um, S3 by itself uh, wasn't going to be enough, so we had to do two additional customizations on top of S3. So the first thing we did was to develop a tool called M5 Data Kit. And you can think of this as like Git, but for data sets. So what this does is it essentially does a lot of bookkeeping about where your data is, uh, what are some of the metadata that went into it. Um, it has things like support for versioning and branching, uh, citations of data, where your data sources are from. And uh, it also tracks the uh, overall lineage of how this, the data sets have been transformed over time. Uh, the second thing we had to do was to realize that the Boto3 Python client for S3 was not really giving us the throughput that we wanted. Um, we use expensive GPUs to, to train, and Boto3 Python client used in a naive way was really not saturating the GPUs as we, as we would have liked them to be. And so what we did was to pybind the S3 C++ client for the read and writes. Um, and that ended up giving us the throughput that we wanted to really saturate those really expensive GPUs. Um, coincidentally, the same methodology is also available to you guys um, on Torch Data. So if you have data on S3, you can try this out. It's called S3IO with Torch Data and try to see if that actually improves your throughput. Cool. Uh, the jobs have to run somewhere. So we have to choose a compute cluster uh, and, and, and a scheduler. And we ended up choosing AWS Batch for our choice of compute cluster. And this was because Batch is actually built ground up uh, to service HPC customers. So one uh, interesting trivia about Batch was that one of the, the goals of AWS Batch was to move uh, traditional HPC customers that are running on-prem onto the cloud. So we wanted to help people uh, make that transition from on-prem clusters into AWS. So a lot of the features and API design that went into batch is very canonical to HPC use cases, which is very relevant to AI use cases as well. Um, the other property of batch that is going to be very relevant for the audience here is that batch itself is a free service. So there is no additional service surcharge for using batch. What you really pay for is just the AWS services, the other AWS services that you use through batch, like EC2 um, or S3. Um, and with this, I'm going to hand it over to Pooja to talk about the uh, rest of the phases. Thanks, Q. <clears throat> so, 
Hi everyone, my name is Pooja Maknikar. I am SDM at Amazon, uh, leading M5 productization experience. I'll be talking about the second stage in model life cycle, that's uh, productizing ML models. So as you can imagine, M5 model size ranges from tens of millions to 100 billion parameters. It's not uh, easy for everyone within Amazon to use these models or experiment with these models because they don't have access to hardware, uh, to best hardware or enough proficiency to invest in high compute performance system. So to overcome this challenge, we distill down large models into smaller ones for better portability and practicality. This, this, helps, us when, uh, this helps us when large M5 models to other teams uh, who doesn't have enough hardware available. Uh, next challenge we faced was our downstream customers uh, do not depend on Python runtime. They use Java or C++ services to build latency sensitive online inference services. Uh, to, to enable these customers, we serialize models using TorchScript and vended out these models to remove dependency on M5 code base as well as on Python runtime. So this was done, uh, but the main challenge here is bringing up uh, research code to production standards. And heavy lifting in productization stage is we invested time and efforts in improving code base used for uh, data processing as well as model source code to meet our production bar by uh, modularizing code base, writing unit tests, integration tests, as well as adding automated quality checks in our CI-CD pipeline. Uh, last but not the least, we also added model card for each of the model uh, in productization stage to give information to customers on how the model was trained, which data set was used, uh, how the model performs on different benchmarking tasks. This helped us achieve ease of use and performance uh, and increase the adoption of M5 across Amazon. Let's have a look at the stats of M5 adoption. So in just last three quarters, we have seen 210 plus teams using M5 models. Uh, they have onboarded, plus there is a 20% average month over month growth in customer adoption. And 100 plus teams are using pre-computed embeddings. I'll cover more details on this later. Uh, but the crux of this stat is us building scalable vending solution helped us achieve the customer adoption goals in 2022. So the next stage in ML model life cycle is vending. In vending stage, we heavily optimized on improving reliability and user centricity of uh, our M5 models. Uh, our downstream customers deploy these models in production system. So it's important to have reliable, uh, ground, reliable source of uh, vending these models. We built central repository called Bazaar a model hub on top of AWS SageMaker to vend out vetted, versioned, and documented models uh, across M5. Using SageMaker model registry uh, enabled us, uh, we enabled us to not invest in, not uh, needing to reinvent the wheel of uh, defining data storage or maintaining the versioning. We just used off the shelf uh, SageMaker model registry for building Bazaar. Uh, the next thing we invested heavily in is benchmarking each model which we went out via Bazaar. All our downstream customers have a variety of tasks, uh, use cases to use these models. Uh, so we kept evolving our benchmarking suite to improve our model quality and task coverage. We included uh, these model cards, uh, we, we included this information in M5 model cards so that all the benchmarking results are available to customers before they choose which model to use for their use case. The next thing we invested was uh, we provided usage script to each customer for every model vended via Bazaar. This enabled customers to uh, help them understand how to query the model hub, how to load the model, uh, how to run the inference using model. Uh, for the vending stage, we categorized use cases into broadly two. One, customers can fine tune M5 models on their custom downstream tasks or they can just pre-compute, they can generate the embeddings using Amazon product catalog. We analyzed that most of the customers were downloading models and setting up pipeline to generate embeddings. We identified this common use case and started generating embeddings for Amazon product catalog. And this helped our customers to, imp 
to increase their experimentation velocity. Uh, next, I'll dive deep further on our M5 model hub referred as Bazaar. Yeah. The right side of this slide shows high-level overview of how Bazaar was built. The top workflow shows the, uh, how M5 trains M5 models uh, using PyTorch eager mode. Uh, first step is uh, Python preprocessing module. The output of Python preprocessing module gets fed to main model, which is in eager mode. So just before productizing these models, we use TorchScript to serialize the Python preprocessing code and serialize deep learning model, and then register it into model hub. The main difference here between other model hubs is we also went out serialized preprocessor. Here, uh, this helped us enabling customers to maintain the consistency in code between training as well as inference. TorchScript has several advantages, including top few, including it does not uh, depend on Python runtime. It enabled our customers to deploy M5 models as is in their inference systems, as well as is re it removed the dependency on M5 code as well as third party uh, training related dependencies. Uh, however, it does come with the cost. We need to invest time and efforts to serialize the preprocessing code and main model and maintain our code's scriptability. Uh, it did work out for us because we serialize model only once, and there are tens or hundreds of customers using this model as is without having to re-implement the preprocessing code or having to bring in all the dependencies coming with model. Next, I'll be talking about the typical customer engagement workflow at M5. As you can see on the right side of diagram, uh, customer engagement funnel can be divided into four stages. First is onboarding, followed by experimentation, uh, followed by deploying to production, and then expanding it to worldwide. We do have baseline on dwell time, average dwell time at uh, each stage of this engagement funnel from various customers. We optimize our products and tools to e reduce this dwell time, as well as to increase the convergence from one stage to the next one. We track model ROI and platform feedback on an ongoing basis through tight partnerships with customers. Uh, we use this engagement data to improve our product quality and user experience. So as a takeaway, the bottom line is we improved research to production velocity for teams across Amazon using these three principles. First, warm start. We created Model Hub, which is collection of pre-trained ML models to start from. So customers don't have to invest time or, uh, time or hardware in training the model from scratch. We have dedicated team of engineers to continuously improve the model quality and generalizability of the models. Second was resource efficient. As you might have known that there was a resource, uh, GPU resource crunch at the start of this year, uh, M5 being the central team, to pre-train the large models, which are resource intensive as well as time in intensive and expertise intensive, uh, by providing these distill, distill version of models via Model Hub to customers, customers can use these models without having to have any prerequisites of hardware. Uh, last is best practices. We are the early adopters of technology, so we learn through our mistakes, and we share our knowledge to customers via models vended as well as tooling and libraries and documentation shared with teams across Amazon. So this concludes our presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you.